Hi, I'm Sportster Paul. This is the fourth video, the final video in our Kian Butterfly Carb Rebuild series. Uh, the first part we'll talk about all I learned about float bowls. I got these six carbs here. I'll show you the differences early and late model float bowls. And then the second part, the misery getting that 79 Sportster started with the rebuilt carb I put on. All kinds of grief with ignition. I had air leaks. I'll show you that. I'll label the, uh, I'll put a big label up, carbon, when I'm talking about the carb, and then I'll change the label to start up or something short that'll fit up there for getting the bike running. So let's go now to, this is the earlier stuff I took of me testing all of these. And then we'll come back and talk about uh, the problems I had getting that 79 started with the rebuilt carb that I put on, okay? All right, now let's look at water squirting out of accelerator pumps. Push it all the way on. It's easier now, it's all wet. Okay. I don't think I've gotten air into the system, but let's see what happens. There's a squirt. Wow, it came halfway up this tube. One depression. That's a lot of gasoline. That surprises me. Second one. So we know this tube is a two squirt. I'm going to start building all these others. I'm going to stop the cameras. I don't want to bore you. And then I'll build a bunch of others. I'll use used parts. Okay, we're back. This is always the case. The bowl that I rebuilt with the brand new custom chrome rebuild kit works the best. Kind of expect that. Uh, I did have enough old parts, junky hard rubber and stuff to actually build the little test on all these others. All one, two, three, four, five, six other carbs. Uh, I learned a lot. Kian, I told you they had good engineers. Well, except for that one middle manager that insists on the fuel inlet, the, this being a cheap piece of plastic over a chunk of brass to save a tenth of a penny. Uh, and he still stayed with him a long time because my 96 Sportster that I had in California had the same goofy thing and it cracked and leaked. And that one I just glommed uh, uh, JB Weld over. You know, hopefully it's still okay. Gave it to a buddy, we'll see. Um, so the clever thing these engineers did, I told you on one of them, okay, this one here, it has a little bleed hole. Right down here, let's see if I can get a pointer. Here we go, nice shiny one. Right there. There's a little bleed hole that they put back into the carb, and that's on the same circuit that goes to the squirter here. I got my plastic tube over it for our test. Uh, and sure enough, when you run the accelerator pump, you can see it squirting up. So that was to reduce, uh, pollution controls are coming in the late 70s. That was to reduce the amount of fuel delivered on an accelerator event. Uh, they just recycled some into the float bowl. And that's nothing smart about that. I think it's dumb because they do give you this screw right here that limits. Let me, uh, let me operate the throttle. Oops, wrong way. I can't. Oh, throttle doesn't work. All right, there we go. See? See how it goes forward? This lower black plastic part is what is connected to this rod that does the accelerator pump action. So if you screw this in, it stops sooner and you don't squirt as much. A lot of guys have way too much gas and the bike really isn't accelerating the best it can. So this one has the, the little thing. Because of the dry O-rings I used in here, this is gonna leak all over, but we'll take my gorgeous Cuisinart tea-making electric kettle. Oh, I should've got the paper towels ahead of time. And we've already got our operating rod in this one. And so, see the air coming out of where the float bubble, where, where that bleed hole is? Again, okay, now a little bit of water came up about a quarter inch above the brass. Now, this does less than half. And you can see it bubbling up here because it's squirting back into the float bowl from that bleed hole. But it's working. Oh, and I should tell you, they all bleed back, every one of these. So either, once they get a little old, the check valve doesn't seal completely, or more likely they didn't think it was important. This, uh, the level in this brass thing is only gonna go down as low as the level of the gas in the bowl, which isn't that far, maybe a half an inch tops. So when you squirted, it just got a little ways up to go. 
uh, it's just kind of a restriction that they put in. They're not trying to make a valve, and that makes sense because there's no spring. You can hear it just rattles around in there. But that was the deal. Now, we're not to the clever part yet, where some engineer did a genius cost reduction. Okay, we'll put that one back here. And which one is Oh, I customized this one for that third missing long screw that actually holds the bowl. It's one of the four that holds the bowl to the thing. I put a C-clamp. It's, since it's an O-ring, it's not really clamping against the gasketed surface. So let's take this. Let's get our little operating rod, get it ready. Now, this one bothered me because the, uh, the little cap, I shook it. Oh, the, it's stuck. It doesn't exist. They took the check valve out of the cap, and this is why. Oh, before I fill it. Uh, maybe too late. You'll notice this one has the bleed hole, too just like this one I showed you. But its bleed hole is built a little different. It's got a little boss, a little flat spot for the drill to hit. I assume they would drill it from the other side, but maybe they drilled it here. And it's got this flat boss. And OK, so this is even later, and it's got numbers on it. When I pour the water out, I'll, I'll hopefully find the numbers for you. So this one, it's like, how does it work without the check valve? Well, think about it. It's, it's incredibly clever. Some guy should have gotten a promotion. Because of this little bleed hole they added in, that's added in to the, to the fill side, to, to the pump out side. So sitting here, it's filling right now. It's going through that little tiny hole and filling that whole passage. And the passage is coming up to level with the water I just put in. And so when you let off of it, well, the check valve kind of works, keeps too much gasoline from being drawn back from the brass part and instead draws the gas from the float bowl. So it's like having two outlets, a tiny one on the brass and the bleed hole that's in the bottom of the float bowl. And they could save the machining and the little check ball and the little swedge down ball on the end cap. So let's watch this one work. <clears throat> Not too dramatic from, uh, from the top, I'm sorry, but. OK, more bubbles, more bubbles coming out that bleed hole. Oh, there's a little action. And this one went up a little higher, about a half inch above the brass. Second one, now it's another half inch. Third one, fourth one. You'll remember on the one I built uh, yesterday, it only took two squirts to fill the hose. I made all the hoses about the same length. But it works. It's brilliant. So let's pour this out, and I'll be able to show you the difference. That little boss should tip you off. While I'm here, it's a good time to get the God love these shop towel. I rented this Kimberly Clark. I don't know who did it, Scott. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll get that. <clears throat> now, <laughs> safety reading glasses. 3M Muvo, M U V O. You got to love them. Here it is. Once again, we got this autofocus crappy camera. And I believe it's for you. It says something 79A. First letter, I'll be able to see it. Uh, you'll be able to see it. So, is it a B? Yes, B, 79, A. So we could figure about then is when they came up with this genius thing. Look, I'm spilling more water. Okay, where'd this come from? Here, paper towel. Um, look at the cap. See, here's. Uh, the older conventional cap. See how they got this little ball swedged in here for the check valve? This one rattles. Here's another one. See, ball check valve rattles. They didn't drill this. And if you take it apart, there's no passage for the entry side. The float bowl is different as well because you can see right here is where they drill the inlet side of the float bowl. They don't need it now because the outlet has an extra hole that lets the gas in. So put this back here. Bring This is the float bowl we're rebuilding for the 79. See right there? Wish the lights were better. Right here, that's where it's drilled through. You can see right through it, air. So that's where it fills. That's the fill side of this little diaphragm pump. This was a pointer. We'll put that back. So live and learn. Got a little water on my gasket. Not good. So I tried all of these. I did two. I mean, I don't think 
Are, is it entertaining? Do you want to see the other ones? Uh, this is a conventional one. All the other ones are conventional. I noticed they're working better. Last night they were squeaky. Some of it has plug passages, like this one had from that wax or paraffin, the bad gas. Uh, mostly air. A little bit higher, about three quarters of an inch. Another three quarter. This is because the the diaphragm is so stiff. Here's three. You know, here's the bad diaphragm that was in some old rebuild that I've kept for sentimental value. Some of these are so stiff. This one looks bad, but it's actually better. That you hear. Oh, I probably didn't hear a crack. That can't be good, right? So custom chrome or some other drag specialties rebuild kit. Okay, it's all filled up again. One. Oh, look at that. It really did a number. It's interesting because it's putting more air out. It's not leaking from here. So I can hear it. This one's got a check valve problem in the ball because it's drawing itself down, right? It squirts. I'm not seeing the, okay. But it's not delivering. So this has a problem. Now you'll know, right? If you do the same thing at home with your, it's like, okay, something's wrong with this. It's not working. Uh, oh, I'll have the movie uh, to show. The yellow bowl got a problem. Uh, we did that one. Have we done this one? For some reason, I put a much longer one. Maybe this one works better than the others. Let's watch this one work. Interestingly, they were all leaking through the uh, out here because of the, the, the dry little o or those little tiny O-rings. Yeah, this one's doing it. I knew one of them had a problem. Now, this one might have a blocked passage, just like the, the card for the 79 did, where it was tar and gradu and all kinds of crap in, the, in this passage here, because it's squirting out the sides. And OK, it's missing a screw here. See that? Get maximum dramatic effect here. <laughs> Not good. So this one has a problem. Where'd this one come from? The glass bowl. Okay, we'll have video proof to help me figure out what to mess with. Same thing. This is we'll go into the Berriman's uh, Chem Dip. I should call it by its real name. Berriman's Chem Dip Carb Cleaner. Great stuff. And I'll leave it there overnight or longer. I'm gonna leave it there for three days. And make sure that this passage is clear. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this has that same problem as this one did. Same trick after the Berriman's, uh, blow it out, make sure that it's passing air, like I showed you in the disassembly. And then uh, can, uh, just uh, carb cleaner, the can, spray can, carb cleaner. Gloves, glasses, spray a, spray a little in there, blow the air and just do that several times to make sure that passage is nice and clean. I won't do any others. Let's I'm excited. I want to get this bike running. OK, that was all about float bowls. I recommend you maybe do the same thing, if, especially if you want to be ultra thorough or you've had recurring problems. Get some water. First, check the float bowl in the accelerator pump. Make sure it's squirting. You don't have to use the tube if you don't want it. Just make sure it feels right, squirts right. If you want, you can put the whole carb together. I was too excited. I blew that off. Put the whole carb together and then use water to make sure that the float works, that, that it's coming up in the needle ceiling. I, I felt good just, you know, uh, sucking or blowing into the uh, fuel inlet and then rocking the carb so the float falls and falls back down on, on the needle. Like it was in the earlier videos. So that all worked. Next, now we're going to talk. I'll put, I'll change the little title about getting that 79 started with the rebuilt carb. Everything had to come back apart. Air leaks, ignition problems. I wasn't thorough. I was so excited. Oh, I was going to go get that running. Finally, it'll be running good. I fixed it. I rebuilt the carb. <sighs> had an air leak. I should have known. It was screaming to me the whole time. I, I got it started. Well, it wouldn't start at all. OK, that, that just off the top, right? Wouldn't start at all. Pull the plugs. Hold the plugs down, crank it, uh, take a screwdriver and push the points by hand. No spark. Okay, where have I seen this before? Could be the coil. Could be the condenser. Because you can see the points. They make little sparks. Get a used condenser I'd laying around. Ah, now a nice, decent spark. 
I figured, oh, the plugs were used, but they looked okay, but get new plugs, a little anti-seize around the threads, careful not to get it on the insulator, screw the plugs in, get it. Now we're getting some action, a little chug or two. It starts, and it's idling really fast, and I back off the screw, and I should tell you about a trick I had to do, see if I can find one. This is the idle mixture screw. This is the idle speed screw. All this screw does is push down on the plate and crack it open. You can even see the threads if the camera focus is working on us. Uh, the problem I had is I couldn't, see you can feel this one too. It's so clean and, and the aluminum gets dug into here from where, and you can't unscrew it. So you can speed it up, but you can't slow it back down so you can play with the idle mixture and get that dialed in. So what I ended, I put anisees there. None of that made us, what worked is I found a nice little washer, might've been a number 12. I think it was bigger than a number 10 that this fit on, and then a steel washer down against the aluminum. I put anisees here, put anisees there, got the uh, spring and made sure where it ends. It wasn't just a blunt cut off like it was. I took it on the uh, belt sander and sanded both ends with a nice little ramp so it's flatter and doesn't have anything to dig in. So now at least you can slow down as well as speed up the idle speed. But it, it, I'd back it all the way off. It, and it, that's telling you, it's an air leak. I warned you about air leaks. I warned you about these crappy rubber band manifolds that I hate. Okay, two kinds of manifolds. This was 1979, first year for the rubber band style. Rubber band style has this big fat rubber band and it goes here and then the carb, uh, or I'm sorry, the heads are the same way. This is the earlier manifold. It's an O-ring manifold like they used for decades, probably since 57. Here's, it, it's got this lip here and just a plain simple O-ring. They come in Viton too, buy them. And then the head is, is, looks the same thing. You put the O-ring in, you use these kind of clamps. These are the factory clamps with the Phillips, not too good. Do like I said in the tips and tricks first video, get an S&S. &S. With a, with a nut driver and you can reef those nice and tight. Well, guess what kind of clamps I had? I had on the rubber band one, right? I had the factory kind of clamps. They're, they're Mickey Mouse for two reasons. They're Mickey Mouse because they've got a Phillips head, which means you can't really torque them enough to compress this rubber enough to get you a nice tight seal. I also noticed one of the heads had a little nick in it. You know, you want to feel around the head and the manifold, make sure there's no flash, wedges, crap. Casting wasn't that good back in the 70s. Uh, so, okay, I figure really reef down. I had right in my stash S&S clamps. I think I've got some pictures I could show you of those. But these are Mickey Mouse not only because you can't get enough torque on a Phillips head screw, to really close down on the rubber. They're also Mickey Mouse because they got this assembly and this little shield thing that, that if you're not careful, you don't pay attention, you can put it on, Let me click it in, you put it on like that. You're guaranteed to have an air leak then. So you're supposed to swing it all around like this. And there's actually all the way forward. And then there's little lips on, on this part that, that kind of pick up the edge of this and it's all high tech and high zoot and then it goes together and then you make sure that it doesn't move around. None of those problems with an SNS style. They have style for the early uh, O-ring style. I'm not sure if these come in Viton or not. My thinking is maybe swelling would be good and of course if you do have this 79 and later O-ring abomination, you have to have that strap that goes down from the air filter down to the lifter block, the number, what is it, one, two, three, the number three lifter block uh, that, that supports it all because there's no amount of reefing, even with the S&S clamps, where the weight of the carb isn't gonna loosen this up, crack it, and you blow up your bike, you blow the piston, you burn a hole in the piston because that air leak gets into that front cylinder and burns it up. Front cylinders run hotter. We can argue why later. So. Got all that off, did what I told you. Now, now I'm starting to pay attention to my own, own lecture. Uh, took the carb off separate. I wasn't gonna try to half clown it. Took the manifold off. I'll put pictures up. You could just see it wasn't really sealing right. Got brand new, I had in my rebuild stuff, brand new rubber bands. Put those on, got the SNS clamp on, reef down, got a nut driver, 
reef down both sides, of course, feeling inside, yeah, looking, making sure the tilt. Uh, it, some of it's just eyeballing. It should be dead, you know, level in plane with, with, the, with the center of the motorcycle. Uh, I also looked, I could see it would pop down and, and it would close up on the bottom. So just kind of, okay, right about there, reef them down, good and hard. Car back on, throttle cable back on, fuel line back on. Uh, I, I was right about, yeah, the entire fuel tank had drained into that float bowl. Here's a picture of the little cone thing in the petcock. You know, I could take that petcock closed and <laughs> blow through it. It's like, all right, that's what happened. The whole tank, maybe racetrack gas isn't the best, but a whole tank of gas over the Florida summer dripping into that float bowl, evaporated off, tarred up the bottom and caused the carb problems. So I got that squared away. Uh, I put the used condenser on and said, well, let's go get a new condenser. Advance Auto is right down the street. I go to Advance Auto. I buy a brand new condenser. Let me get my 3M Muvo reading and safety glasses on. Highly recommended. The condensers, they used to cost us a dollar and a quarter. $12.99 with 91 cents Florida tax, $13.00 and 90 cents for a condenser. Of course, in defense of United Auto, it was on the shelf. The young guy knew how to figure it out and find the right one. So, okay, new condenser. I put new plugs in it, I may have mentioned, just because why not, right? Static time the bike, because I retarded it to get it to go around the block, and when it came back, it had a bright blue front pipe. If I, I should have known when the carb didn't idle up right. But no, I had to drive it a little, all excited, and turn the front pipe bright blue. All right, I knew I had an air leak then. So I got the air leak situation fixed, got a new condenser in it. Of course, then took it back out because I wanted to static time this bike, and it's a good thing I did. What I'd done initially, you know, the, the breaker plate with, with the points on it. They say, well, there's this slot where the two bolts go in. Just center it, and you'll probably won't be too far off. Well, that's not true. I ended up all the way at the end of the slot. And you can, there's plenty of stuff on the web, static time. You take the timing plug out of the left side of the crankcase, where, right where the cylinders come together, there's a plug. Uh, a lot of confusion, because this wasn't an original flywheel. I'd replaced the flywheels. Some early years, the big long notch, that means advanced. That's your advance bar. Other times, it's top dead center. Good luck figuring out what you got. I took the spark plugs back out and put a little screwdriver down there and very slowly and very carefully don't bend anything brought it up it's like oh okay so the timing mark i think on the particular flywheels that was in this particular bike were two dots and back around felt it coming up just starting oh okay here's 40 some years were 40 some were 45 who knows there's no way i can tell They're, they were both just a, a groove so the long groove in the middle that's full advance and you go back around i think it was a 12 millimeter metric wrench if you take the condenser out you can get that on the lobes of the spinning part right the, the cam that operates the points and you can go down in other words you're trying to move you're trying to advance it you're trying to move it counterclockwise which brings it up sooner that the point it brings it closer to the little block on the points and then you adjust the plate so that it it just cracks the points you got, it, you got the full advanced timing mark set on the flywheel. And, oh, make sure when you kick it, you get a poof that, that it's on the compression stroke. Otherwise, none of this makes sense. So poof, you feel the air coming out. Okay, now the front cylinder's on compression stroke. You go, and sometimes you can just put a screwdriver in, straight slot, as you kick it, and it'll catch that, uh, that slot. Life is good. Get it back centered, pry it back centered. Then you go to the point side. If you've got a buddy, then life's a lot easier, but I was by myself. So then 12 millimeter, I think it was, uh, metric wrench, you can fit them over the, the lobes and push down. Some guys, I used to use uh, needle nose pliers, little Mickey Mouse, right? But the, the wrench worked good. You go, and, and what you're doing is you're expanding the, uh, the, the flyweights. You're making it full advance, like the thing was spinning and the flyweights are all the way out. That's just when you want the points to open. That's full advance. That's when that mark and this. I had it high tech. I had a multimeter hooked up, disconnected the, uh, the, the coil, because then you're just going between coil resistance and, and uh, 
the, uh, shorted when the points are closed. So then you can see the points. They're closed, they're closed. You spin the plate. Oops, they just open. And you kind of get a feel. It's miserable, but everything is. The right way, of course, is you put the clear plug in where that timing plug goes. You start the bike. You run it up to 2,000 RPM and make sure you can see that, uh, make sure that, that groove, that channel in the flywheel is dead center. This was good enough. Got that. Like I said, the plate was all the way on the edge of its, I think, in the, all the way advanced, which is good. Too much advanced, it kicks back, and if you know how to kick, you won't break your leg. Too much, uh, uh, too much retard, you burn valves, you burn holes in pistons. So always err to the advanced side. So I said, I don't like any of this. Of course, I'm thinking, did I get the cams in right? Do I have a tooth off on the cam? People tell me you know right away. Well, the bike started the instant it started. I could see happy bike. It acted like the 77, which you would expect. I just rebuilt that one. Uh, got it, it idled up. Now the idle speed screw works. When there's, since there's no air leaking in extra, when you close back that screw off, it slows down so much, and you can just get it idling. Then mix with that mixture screw on the top. You know, first this one to get it close. Excuse, here's a factory one of the hex head. First, the, the, the mixture one to get it close. I'm oh, sorry. First, the idle speed one, just to get it down below the advanced curve, so it's kind of idling. Then you mess with the mixture screw, get the maximum RPM, you know, a little this way, a little that way, kind of figure where you are. Maximum RPM, and most guys like to open it up a little. Quarter turn, half a turn. I'm still experimenting with that because it still chugs just a little. And I did, uh, of course, adjust the valves now because I'm doing it right. What I should have done, instead of getting so excited, thinking I solved the problem, I just had a carb problem. I had multiple problems on this bike. So I pulled the valve covers, got the push rods all squared away, and uh, made sure everything was loose and the, the valves weren't, weren't, you know, they were closing, the valve lashes, okay. Got that, got the ignition, uh, new spark plugs, new $13, almost a $14 condenser. I uh, fixed the air leaks and first kick. It, it, it almost started completely. It, it ran on a little, and then because of the mixture and stuff isn't adjusted, it died. Second kick, it's running, and you can just tell it's running right. Boom, boom, there's no backfiring through the carb like was happening before. I take it around the block, warm it up. Now I get the mixture dialed, uh, get that happy, get the idle speed kind of. I, I, like I used to try to go thump, thump. All that does is stop, you know, stall at a light, then you gotta kick it and you go around and you're kicking it or you get killed in the middle of the night because nobody can see you. Uh, especially a magneto bike where you lose the tail light and the headlight. So it just ran great. Still chugs a little on the carb. The jets are one are 88 intermediate, 165 main. I'm gonna play with that. It's got this 1970 one year only ultra quiet exhaust. It's a retirement community. Give me a break. Anybody can make a bike loud, you take the mufflers off. So uh, I'll hopefully simichrome up that front pipe and make the blue a little less obvious, I hope, because it's pretty embarrassing. And then get it on the road and start running it bigger and bigger circles, you know, three mile trips, 10 mile trips, 20 mile trips, until it's good and reliable the way it was in California before I moved here. So that was the misery, getting this stuff started intake problems, ignition problems, everything. At least the valves were kind of loose enough, so I, I didn't have that wrong. Got, uh, you know, be thorough. Don't do what I did. It get all excited thinking, well, the car's rebuilt. Now the, I expect the bike to run perfect. Check. I, I may have been able just to tighten these Mickey Mouse factory clamps and, and got it, gotten the air leaks gone, but why bother? You could see there's, uh, the pictures might have shown you, there's a, a groove in some places where, where the gap was between the head and the manifold. In other places, it was smooth, so maybe just not touching it and reefing on it. Those clamps had to go. I had s, &S clamps. Problem solved. The bike's happy. I think the next big seminar we'll have will be on the ignition stuff. Uh, I, by reading up, I burned... The, the reason this bike started having problems is I burned a piston. I had, a, I think, a CompuFire or maybe a Dyna, Electronic ignition, electronics guy. I didn't really understand the advance. I had the, the, it set wrong. And on a trip to Hollister back in the day, it burned a hole in the piston. So Weisco pistons and jugs, got it put all back together. And 
Now I think finally it's going to be running like it did five years ago because it's never been quite right. So we'll talk about ignitions next. Then we got stuff for LED headlights, LED taillights, lots to talk about here. Not just fixing stuff, but customizing, repair, maintenance, all those issues. All right, Sportster Paul signing off. Thanks for your patience. Hope you watched all four. But if not, at least hope you learned something to make your Iron Sportster run a lot better.